Okay, good afternoon. I, for one, am really excited that we're at the three o'clock hour where we're really doing a wrapping session. That's a wrap-up session, I should say, with our mayor, Gleam Davis, and our city manager, Rick Cole. And before I turn it over, I just want to say on behalf of the entire city team that's worked on this event, uh, we hope you've all enjoyed it, and we hope the many hundreds of other people who came through today enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's because we had great sponsors to help step up that we could make this a high quality, accessible, and free to the public event. So we're really excited about that. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alejandro Adler who comes to us from New York, where he works with the United Nations Sustainable Development Institute at the Earth Institute with Columbia. And um, Alejandro is really an old friend of Santa Monica. You may not know that, but when we first began this work, Alejandro was at Penn as a graduate student. Yeah, okay, wow. You've done a lot in the last few years. Alejandro um, was a friend to us as we were really beginning to think about how to approach this whole well-being measurement area. As many of you know, we had been at it in the youth area with our first youth well-being report card, and we wanted to take it to the next level. And Alejandro has been a partner and friend for the last um, five or six years on our journey. So we're delighted that he's going to moderate this session for us with our mayor and our city manager as we talk about where we go from here. Please remember, it's the we of where we go from here because we're really all in it together. Thank you. Thank you, and before we start, can I ask you to join me in a huge round of applause to Julie Rusk, the rock star who put this all together and this wonderful day, set of days initiative. Julie, you're a rock star. And I'm really thrilled to be here today with, uh, yes, um, with <laughs> Mayor Gleam Davis and uh, City Manager Rick Cole, and, and really to talk a little bit about uh, how we got here uh, as uh, the city of Santa Monica, where we are now and, uh, and where we are going. And I have uh, more specific questions, of course, but I think uh, before we talk about where we're going, it would be helpful, I think, to situate how we got here. How did this entire journey begin? How did well-being even become an idea, let alone become institutionalized into uh, becoming an official objective into the indicators? How did this happen? Well, I'll start, and then Rick can uh, play back clean up there. So unfortunately, um, some years ago, uh, this city was hit with a series of tragedies. We lost a number of young people to gang violence, and we also lost several young people, including my son's best friend, to suicide. And that, I think, really triggered widely throughout the community that we needed to do something. How do, clearly we were not serving our young people. And so a series of initiatives developed, including Cradle to Career, the Youth Report Card, a number of things that the idea was to focus on our youth, not only to try and evaluate why they were in these desperate straits, but what we could do to help them, to try and go where they were. Um, and that work was very good and done by a number of people in the community in a number of different um, formats. Uh, then the opportunity with Bloomberg Philanthropies came up, um, I think it was six years ago now, and we were, uh, through the hard work of Julie Rusk and many others on city staff, able to obtain a $1 million grant from Bloomberg Philanthropies. And the purpose of that grant was to specifically do something innovative at the city level. The Bloomberg Philanthropy idea is that a lot of the problems that we talk about on a daily basis, certainly they need to be addressed at the federal or the state or the regional level. But some of the hard but best work can be done at the local level. And so the idea was to empower cities to solve those problems. And we used that grant to develop the well-being index. And there were two requirements for that. And one is that it had to be open. And it is, in fact, anybody who wants to see the data, any other 
community that wants to do their own well-being index is welcome to everything we have, and two, it has to be scalable. And so I know that we've had a number of communities, I've literally traveled all over the world and had a number of people approach me about doing this work. So what has happened is that as we've been doing the index, and we've now done a couple of full-blown studies, we are able to measure, and in an affluent community like Santa Monica, there are some surprising results. Like not all of our children are ready to go to kindergarten, and far too many of our seniors live in isolation. But what can be measured can be improved, and that is our goal. Is the next step, and we're going to get to that, but we now have gotten much better at measuring it. Now we're going to start using it to implement policy. And so now I'll hand it over to Rick, whose job is to implement policy. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. And, and let me add to what the mayor has said by, by being very uh, candid. Um, philanthropy is wonderful, and to get a million-dollar grant um, for our city was a, a great boost of resources that didn't come from the, from the taxpayer. But um, philanthropy often has a, a, a short attention span. Uh, they, they, they give a grant, they say, well, it wasn't this great, and then uh, five years later, the question is, did, did anything really improve, right? Or, or did it just sound really um, exciting? Um, and when I became city manager uh, four and a half years ago, um, we actually had more attention around the world for what Santa Monica was doing than we had in our own community, uh, even within our own city government. Um, people had read some articles. Um, there was a little bit of snarkiness, like, oh, you know, they got this money and they're spending money on happiness. And meanwhile, there are actual problems in the city and how come they're not dealing with the actual problems? Um, and so... Uh, with the direction of the council, I think it was our job um, to make this real, right? To, to, to bring this down from the abstract, academic, intellectual level, which is very powerful, right? This, we're, we're, this is grounded in, in, in brain science, in, in significant um, academic research from, from people all over the world as part of a worldwide movement. But, but was it actually going to find roots in Santa Monica? So we began with our city government, and we began to, to think about how do we apply this to what we're measuring inside city government. And Because normally what we measure is how many miles of pavement we've, we've done this year, or how many people we arrested this year, um, or, or um, you know, how many library books got checked out. And so we began to think about, well, what about the outcomes um, of our library and law enforcement uh, and public works? Is that actually improving the quality of life and the standard of living in our, in our city? It turns out that's a harder challenge than you would think. Um, that measuring what we do and how it affects how you live in our community is not a trivial um, challenge. But we had the advantage of this great work from Rand and people like Dr. Adler that helped us and then we tried to apply it inside city government with the folks who who work in our libraries, in our parks, in our, in our uh, resource and recycling, the folks who pick up the garbage. Um, and that's been a journey. And the next step was to begin to apply that to how we make fiscal decisions, right? Let's put the money where it will have the most impact. Let's begin to um, measure. It may sound good to spend money on something, but is it actually improving the quality of life in the communities, making people safer? Um, so those are, those are questions that we're now really becoming rigorous on. It is also a, a difficult journey. Uh, and the next step, frankly, was uh, what we're doing today, which is to ensure that the community feels like this isn't something that government is doing. This is something that we're all doing. And, and I think part of the, the challenge, Dr. Adler, is the vocabulary, right? Well-being means something in, in Bhutan, it means something in the United Nations, it means something in, in Great Britain, it means something in South Africa. But here in Santa Monica, I think what well-being means is advocating for your kids to get a new soccer field. Uh, well-being means volunteering at your church at the food bank. Uh, well-being means um, coming to city council and uh, expressing your viewpoints either in person or um, uh, online. Uh, well-being that that's, it's not something way up here. It's what we all aspire to, it's what we all do. And that it's a partnership between you and your government 
and that there really isn't them and us. In a democracy, it should be us. So, uh, Rick, going back to this point, uh, which we encounter often working with city, state, and national governments of bridging this idea that well-being, happiness is this very abstract, ethereal um, goal, while we have real problems, poverty, homelessness, inequality, why does well-being matter? Why does well-being matter? Why does well-being matter? And not only that, but why should well-being matter to the government? If often people say this is a very private matter, uh, the government's function is to provide services, my well-being is my personal responsibility. So why does it matter and why does it matter for the government? And f For both of you, of course. I'm gonna start. <laughs> <laughs> That's the joy of being in the middle. I get to grab the mic. Um, <laughs> well, well-being matters because whatever it is you're concerned about in our city, if it's homelessness, if it's crime, it's the affordability of housing, the lack of economic opportunity, income inequality, poverty, these are all symptoms of the disease of a lack of well-being. So if we're really serious about solving these problems, the way we're going to solve them is by digging into that well-being work. Now, obviously, in the short term, yes, we need to address crime. We need to put officers on the street. In terms of homelessness, we need to find permanent supportive housing for homeless people. We recognize we need to do these immediate steps to try and reduce the impact of these scourges on our society. But if we don't get to the underlying problem, which is that lack of well-being, then all we're gonna do is be faced with the same symptoms over and over and over again. And just like in the medical field, it, where it's more expensive to treat somebody in the emergency room than to do preventative care, if you think of homelessness, crime, poverty, income inequality as the symptoms that you go to the emergency room for, but well-being as the preventative care, what you find is that the dollar you invest in well-being is very well spent. And so that's why, as Rick said, it's, it's not some economic, uh, I mean, esoteric, squishy-wishy thing about, oh, we have the luxury of well-being because we're in a fir an affluent community. We can't afford to not focus on well-being because if we don't focus on well-being, a lot of the things that each and every one of us faces in our daily lives that makes us unhappy or vexes us will continue to go on. So my feeling is this is like a dollar well spent in well-being, you know, both socially and in terms of capital, will save us so much more down the road. I agree, Mayor, and let me put it in a different um, format that may at first seem a little bit abstract, but I, I want to connect it to where we are in 2019. All the things we do traditionally in city government they were invented. People sort of think that, well, because throughout my whole life, government's always done police and fire and parks and libraries, that that's just, that's what government does. That's what it was invented to do, is to provide at the local level police and fire and libraries and parks and land use regulation. That's, that's the nature of, all those actually were invented. Um, working people didn't go to college and yet they needed and wanted um, to learn. And so we created public libraries. Um, we were an industrial country that built our factories and our cities out of wood and we used fire to heat them and, and to, to make the economy go. So we had to invent a fire department. Um, we had people pouring into the cities from the farms of America and there was a lot of crime. So we had to invent police departments, and we copied it from Britain, who had gone through the same thing a few decades before. We invented the things that cities do because we had problems of health, safety, and well-being. And so what we do today is not always a good fit for today's problems. If we were creating a government today, we probably would have a Department of Homelessness. Right? Because 
Our libraries cope with homelessness, but it's a challenge. Our parks cope with homelessness, but they're not really designed to deal well with that. Our police department is a national model of trying to do, deal with homelessness, but you cannot arrest your way out of homelessness. And so we, are not, we actually haven't designed our government today for today. And so what well -be by measuring well-being and by setting the goal of well-being that the mayor has talked about as preventative medicine, we need to actually reshape and redesign uh, what we do and why we do it. Um, Olga asked uh, in an earlier session, uh, quoting uh, something I had said, that the government thinks of itself as being in the service business. You know, we're the ones who pick up the trash, we're the ones who provide you the water, we're the ones that, that uh, will, will enforce the law. In fact, what, what the Constitution of the state of California says is, is government here is for the health, safety, and well-being of the citizens of California. If you go to the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you go to the Constitution, to promote the general welfare. That's what well-being is, is it's the goal. The goal is not just individual well-being, but community well-being. Uh, Madison said if, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government. Um, men are not angels. Uh, even some women are not angels. A and, and so we, we, we work together to be better than we would be in a, in a Darwinian state of nature. We work together to take care of each other. Uh, we work together to, to return to um, a sense of, of communal and collective well-being. So I think that, uh, at least to me, clarifies the why well-being, why well-being as a, as a legitimate political and policy objective. Uh, my next question is the what and the how, uh, especially moving forward. I've spent the last three days in Santa Monica, and I'm beyond blown away to uh, 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 just by by the amount of progress over the last four years. We've worked with 13 countries now, uh, from Bhutan to Australia, Finland, and everything in between New Zealand, and the fact that in only four years you've been able to fully build a robust well-being index, you have been able to map six different domains and track differences, that is beyond admirable in, in, in such a short span. My question is what to do about it to narrow the gaps of where you want to be Santa Monica or where, and where you are now on the six different domains, how to translate the indicators and the data you have into policy action. And what, if we can put a time span, can Santa Monica commit to within the next five to six years, let's say from now until 2025, what well-being policies can Santa Monica commit to that would not be here if well-being were not a policy focus. I don't want to be a mic cog, so I'll let you start here. Um, I, I want to answer the question directly, but I want to, before that, um, you asked about what and how. I think the most important question is actually who. Right? Because if it's up to the government, um, government all by itself in today's stressful democratic times is just not up to it. One of the disappointing um, uh, results which we're, which we're previewing of the full index that will be coming out as a result of, of the work that's been done for the third version of the, of the well-being index is that um, belief that you can influence your government has come down from a low number of 29 to an even lower number of 20. Um, that, that's obviously heartbreaking for those of us who believe in democracy. Unfortunately, I think it's true you know, at so many levels of government today um, that people have lost faith in government, whether it's in Britain, you just go down the list of, of, of 
of countries and certainly in, in our country. So the who is going to be, it starts, I think, with democracy and it starts with the 700 people who've come here today and give yourselves a hand for participating in today. So if the so so rather than you know ask the, the mayor and the city manager you know what are we going to do in the next five years I think it's it's what are we going to do uh, in the next five years and I think that will come out of, of the democratic process um, we already are committed to some very important um, endeavors uh, the most important of which um, I think uh, is how we're tackling um, the issues of crime and homelessness. Um, because that goes to the very core of what government is for, is a sense of, of, of security and safety. Um, other, other issues, really, if you can't um, ensure that, we remain a very safe community. But people don't feel safe. Um, and it's no consolation if it we're a safe community and you're a victim of crime. Um, so... Uh, that's a comprehensive approach, and, and I think what will be different because of the well-being index and the well-being work and the second, third, fourth, and fifth well-being summit that I hope people will be part of, I think what will be different is it won't be just the, the, the solution to crime and homelessness is to, is to send them all to Lancaster uh, and arrest them all, right, which is, which is the default that I think we're verging to as a society. People are becoming frustrated. They're becoming um, uh, intolerant, and they're saying, I I'm not going to accept this anymore, and I might vote for Bernie Sanders, but I want you to lock those people up. That, that, that's remarkable, uh, and I think we're verging for that. I think Santa Monica is going to be the exception to that. We're going we're to work to find a more humane and preventative strategy. Now, we can't do that in just 8.3 square miles, right? These are bigger problems with, with state laws, et cetera. But I think what's going to be different is we are going to be on a fundamentally different trajectory that's about preventative solutions um, rather than reactive ones. So uh, I got into politics generally because of educational issues, and so I bring that bias to it. Um, a couple of metrics, and, and I think we should point out that when the council set its budgetary framework priorities, uh, as we go into our budgeting process, one of our priorities was to be an engaged and thriving community. And those weren't just words on a piece of paper. In fact, we have formed a committee that is designed to help develop metrics to tell are we in all of the priorities, which were also included reducing homelessness, making our neighborhoods safer, that sort of thing, but to develop metrics across all these budgetary priorities so we can tell are we really doing what we set out to do. Um, but I think in education there are a couple of things there that... Are a couple of members that... Well, there you go, see? Um, welcome. I, but I, I was going to say, so I think that, you know, for example, kindergarten readiness, which was one of the early things we started to study using the international EDI. And it was shocking to find out that in Santa Monica, the number of children who actually were not ready across the scale, some were very ready academically, but not emotionally and or socially, but the number of kids who weren't ready for kindergarten. And so as a city, I've always said our job is to deliver a child to the school system, which typically starts either in pre-K or K, someone who is ready to begin to learn, someone who's on uh, and even playing with everyone else in the community. And I think seeing some movement in that over the next few years, because I believe education is the silver bullet and the great equalizer, will make a difference. Um, but I do want to emphasize one of the things that Rick said, which is that this is all about us. And, and homelessness, to me, is a perfect example. So one of the things I would like to see as we start to refine the well-being index and start to measure people's attitudes is we all look at homeless people, and a lot of us feel very uncomfortable, maybe because they're committing some antisocial behavior or whatever, and we think, I shouldn't have to look at that. What if we change that paradigm and said, when I see that homeless person, I'm not going to focus on my discomfort, but how uncomfortable it must be to be in the grips of drug addiction, to be in the grips of a mental health crisis, to frankly just not be able to afford a roof over your head. And the second we start to change that attitude, 
You know, when we talk about housing, instead of worrying about, oh my God, how many people are going to bring cars here, or it's going to get more crowded at the supermarket, think about if we build more housing, a mother and her son will be able to live in Santa Monica closer to her work, and her son will be able to attend our fabulous public schools. I don't know this person, but I care about this person. And I think in the next five or six years, what I would like to see is really move the needle on our own attitude, our collective attitude, so that when we see these problems, we don't think about how it negatively impacts us, but we try to think about how do we solve it for the other person, because it's that collective work we do where we start to think about the broader community, not what's in it for us, but what's in it for the community is really when I think we're going to push the needle on well-being. Good. And Rick. Uh, could I just add one? I don't know how much money you got. Um, just, just very briefly, a place to see this in action is Virginia Avenue Park. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's in the center of a neighborhood where, where because the Pico neighborhood is historically and um, economically kind of central to, to the question of, of equality and equity in our community. What's happened in Virginia Avenue Park over the last 10 years is, is nothing short of phenomenal. Um, a new library, um, a farmer's market, um, youth, youth programs that reach all kinds of kids, um, uh, real empowerment of some of our Spanish-speaking immigrants um, and, and our African-American um, neighbors that, that used to have a much more vibrant um, presence in our city before the freeway and the Civic Auditorium and the high school got built and um, where those neighborhoods lived. Virginia Avenue Park was a place where people were afraid to go uh, 10, 15 years ago, and, and now it's, it's an incredibly welcoming and, and rich place because of a partnership between, the, it wasn't the government came and said, oh, we'll, we'll just scatter our, our, our wealth and programs here. It was a genuine partnership, sometimes a contentious par partnership. There, there were voices of, of, of dissent and voices of, of criticism. All that helped lead to a positive outcome because ultimately it, it translated into collaboration. So to me, that's a, if you want to ask about, well, what's, what's this well-being stuff? Go to Virginia Avenue Park. So before opening, a, uh, opening up for questions, um, I'll, I'll share from our uh, local, regional, international uh, experience, uh, we've seen that government is absolutely necessary but far from sufficient, and you were, um, you were not, so, uh, not so softly pointing at, at that, Rick. And, and we've seen that the, the best model is to actually have uh, public-private social sector partnerships and have every single stakeholder take ownership over these well-being policies and practices. So that's uh, number one. Number two, the lowest hanging fruit where there are so many opportunities to implement uh, well-being policies and practices, but where we've seen the most bang, well-being bang per buck is indeed in education, particularly in early childhood development and skills development. Number two, health, particularly mental health. Free, easy access to mental health um, and eliminating the taboo of mental health um, at a social level. And finally, places. The enormous impact of making community spaces beautiful, open, and uh, easy to access. So I don't know if uh, the two of you have a reaction to those two points. Uh, one, the importance of public-private social sector partnerships, and two, that these three sectors or uh, entry points, and by the way, the synergies between the three, health, education, and, and places, or, um, urban design, are the most direct ways to impact well-being before opening it up for uh, questions. 
Well, I think we've actually seen that here in Santa Monica in terms of places. Rick's discussion about Virginia Avenue Park is a perfect example where we took a place that was considered dangerous and with the work of a lot of people in the community, as Rick said, it wasn't just the government waving a magic wand, but a lot of people in the community. Now it's a beautiful park in a real community center. Um, moving the needle on early childhood education, we are building our fabulous early childhood lab school in the Civic Center. And I know there's been a lot of controversy about the placement of it, but I will tell you that my opinion is the Civic Center is exactly where we should tell the world that we are investing in our youngest people, that we are going to make sure, as I said earlier, that every child enters kindergarten ready to learn. And in case there's any doubt about it, because I know there's been a lot of misinformation about there, the number one group of people who are gonna have access to that center are low-income Santa Monica residents. The second group of people are gonna be Santa Monica residents. That is a center that is being built for the residents of Santa Monica. Yes, other groups, because of their participation, will have access. But the first and second groups that are gonna have priority are gonna be Santa Monica residents. On the third one, in terms of mental health, I think that is the hardest one. I've lived in California a very long time, and I remember when we emptied the mental institutions with the promise of community mental health centers, and then of course never built the community mental health centers, and now those chickens are unfortunately coming home to roost. But I do think that it is incumbent on each of us to, one, work on removing the stigma from seeking services in mental health. You know, uh, it was said in one of the earlier um, Groups. We, we had a former superintendent of schools, and when he interviewed, I was on the interview committee, and they asked him, what do you wish for the students in our schools? And the first thing he says is something outside of academia that sustains them, whether it's music or dance or art, but something that isn't their job, but something that they love to do. And he said the second one was a non-family member adult that they knew. And those two things, to me, speak to mental health, because if you have something you love, whether it's painting or making music or just going for a walk in one of our parks, or if you have someone else to speak with, if you're a child and it's an adult, or if you're an older person and it's just a good friend, that is the way we can improve mental health. We clearly need to do a better job of providing services, but achieve each and every one of us want to improve the mental health of our community. Think of someone you know who needs a good friend and be that good friend. Let me step away for a moment from my title and role as city manager and, and speak to you as Rick Cole. I was 62 years old before I moved to Santa Monica. My stepfather was born here. I, I've been here a thousand times as a Southern Californian. Um, I've followed Santa Monica city government for 30 years. You have no idea what an extraordinary community this is if you've been immersed in it. Um, I've had the the benefit of working in, in city governments um, throughout Southern California, and um, no other city could do what we're doing here today. No other city, not Beverly Hills, not Pasadena, not Long Beach, not Los Angeles. Um, so on education, voters in the city twice have voted to raise their taxes, the sales tax, and both times half of it went to public education. There is literally no city government in California, and there are 482 of them, that writes a $26 million check every year to support public education because of this community. Um, when it comes to health, um, there's, there's no other community where there is such a partnership between um, St. John's, UCLA, um, the, uh, the Kaiser and Cedar sinai um, and, the, and the health community to think about how to improve the health of, of this community. We have a long way to go, um, but, but, but it's a cornerstone of, of, this, of this city. Um, and when it comes to placemaking, um, the Third Street Promenade um, dramatically changed how Southern Californians um, looked at, at public life, right, up until the promenade opened in 1989. People went to malls. That's where you went to, you know, and, and suddenly people rediscovered uh, streets. Not streets where the, a security guard would come and tell you, I'm sorry, you can't be here, but a real 
public street. Uh, and, and we're doubling down on that now with Promenade 3.0 is we want to make it even more public space uh, in the future. So Santa Monica is, is a real um, beacon. Now, is it perfect? No. Do we have a lot of, of, of criticism and an and active political debate? Yes, that is actually a sign of health. It is not always comfortable, and and you know those of us who are at the receiving end of that criticism sometimes wish it wasn't so personal. Um, but the reality is is that Santa Monica is in a class by itself in Southern California, and uh, and I know that because I'm not from here. Uh, I've come to to experience and love this place because it is so different. Uh, from much of, of what surrounds us. There are good people everywhere, and they're all struggling to, to make their communities better. But the constellation of resources and how they come together, and how they've come together over the last 30 years on just these issues, is why we have a well-being summit, is why people around the world are looking to us as an example. And sometimes I think we're not proud of just how hard we've worked, how much we've accomplished, and, and how aspirational we are in this community. Uh, it's really unique. Thank you. I, 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 first, uh, a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> and uh, we'll move on to questions. So you hold the mic. So, let me start. so I know there's a lot of people who have a lot of questions. And I can tell by looking around the room, there's a lot of differing points of view of those of you in the room. And what I'd really like for the next 10 minutes is to see if we can hear a sprinkling of those different points of view. And I'd really like to ask that we can all show up in the spirit of solutions and how we can work together. Because that's really what we've tried to create today is a platform for us. It doesn't mean we can't disagree, but let's try and do it in a really kind and gracious way on this beautiful day in Santa Monica. So I'm going to start in the back because I, so thank you for, thank you, thank you for that, for those of you who appreciated that. And I saw that there was a hand back there and we're going to work our way around and we have about 10 minutes. So yeah, thanks Alejandro. I'm sorry, right here. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Hi there. Um, yes, uh, the well-being. This is wonderful. Um, I do feel, having known of Santa Monica and being here for now 15 years, that your sustainability agenda really, I felt, was sort of the sort of foundation because it started to create in people's mind the sort of green way of living rather than just making money, 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 and let's get rich type of thing. So, um, and I know that you had incredible partnerships like Sustainable Works, Santa Monica College, and all this stuff that was involved in that. So that was a question, that was a statement. And yes, thank you for raising that. Hold on. Well, in fact, we haven't mentioned it, but we have declared ourselves to be a sustainable city of well-being. So we see the connection between the two. Work, work around, and I saw a hand back up in here. Is there a hand? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, what is the um, your your current approach or thoughts uh, or plans about using technology in in any of these well-being goals that you you have well let me let me give you an example um, uh, we we've worked uh, out of the digital health lab at USC um, with a startup um, called Aikido um, to to create a uh, an app we call connect that we've provided to our first responders in testing mode um, police and fire now uh, will be able to notify and connect with a social worker uh, if someone is arrested who uh, either isn't connected to services uh, or who is, and we can reconnect them or let them know if they have a caseworker, for example, um, you know, we just picked someone up for public intoxication. 
Um, but we didn't have that before, and, and we did, certainly didn't have it in real time. It's just one small example of how um, the application of technology can be for something other than um, some of the frivolous things that it's used for um, in the world of social media, for example. Hi there. Uh, thank you for putting this summit on. I, it's clear that you do care about the well-being of Santa Monica. But we hear some of the 80% who feel that you aren't listening to our concerns and you're not addressing them, and we really wish you would. Um, when you say, well, for example, when you say um, that we don't, something about it, it's, it's perceived as not a safe city, but it is a safe city, we, we don't feel safe because it isn't safe. We, all of us have been here for many, many years, and five years ago, according to the FBI crime statistics and part one crimes, we were the 40th most crime-ridden city in California. As of 2018, that's gone to number three. So we do have a legitimate concern and we don't feel that that's being heard and we don't want all the homeless to be shipped to Lancaster. It's not about that. And we do feel they're suffering, but we don't feel anybody's feeling our suffering when our children go to play in the parks and there's syringes or, in, or on the beach. When I came out of my house this morning and there was human feces all in my front yard, when many of us as women have had a lot of trouble just walking down the street, which I can tell you my entire life in Santa Monica, I have not felt that way until recently. And, you know, there's things to back us up. And we do have solutions too. We would love to talk to you about our solutions. One of them is... Um, a big percentage of the people who are committing crimes over and over are recidivists who have long, long, long uh, records. We've been tracking them, and they're arrested over and over and over. And I know there's state laws involved, but it seems like there should be something more locally, some consideration given for our safety to keep these guys who have the long records locked up more. Also, there's some people who we see, you could, know, we've could, seen could, just, could just we one, more, one more point. We would like to see you implement the conser uh, conservatorship measures more for the people who are out on the streets that are clearly suffering, screaming and yelling and, and, and can't help themselves. Thank you. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, I think that's the most important um, challenge for, for, for government. Um, when I said we're a safe city, um, four years ago when I came here, um, we actually had the lowest rate of crime that we've had in Santa Monica since the 1950s. Um, and, and that's pretty remarkable. People, I think, forget that Santa Monica's often had um, challenges, mostly because uh, we're a community that draws an, an extraordinarily disproportionate number of visitors. The, the statistics you recited, I can't verify whether we're 40th or 3rd or whatever, but those statistics are not compared um, to cities of other 100,000 who don't have 9 million visitors. The vast majority of part one crimes that we report to the federal government are property crimes. And the vast majority, literally thousands of them, are people's property being stolen out of cars, in many cases, that they've left open. Tourists that have left their luggage or their cameras or their what have you. Are there um, serious crimes in our city? Yes. But um, the vast majority of crimes are property crimes. The vast majority of them were compared to uh, cities that don't have literally 9 million visitors a year. So we are a safe city, but we could be safer, and we're not as safe as we were four years ago. But this year, because of the concerted efforts of our police department in collaboration with the community, crime is down 15% as of this date over last year. We are, we are taking seriously the issue of crime in our city, and we're making a difference, and you should help us. And I just want to add a couple of things. We know our public spaces are issues. So, for example, one of the things we've done is taken the Downtown Ambassadors Program and expanded that into Tongva Park and into Reed Park and into Palisades Park. And by all accounts, that's made a real difference in terms of people's safe 
the feeling of well-being and safety in those parks. So we know there are problems and we hear there are problems, but people need to understand. We hired 15 new police officers in the year that I've been mayor, and I'm very proud of that. But we can't hire police officers our way out of the system. We don't want to turn it into an armed camp. So we're working on the problems and we hear what people want, but we also, as you acknowledge, have constraints of state law. The people of this state voted that the public use of drugs is a misdemeanor, which means it's a ticket. It's like speeding. Three days in jail. Three days in jail, and, and you have to go to the county jail, which is overfilled, so when we take them to the jail, they just turn them loose again. So that's why you get a lot of recidivism. So this is a larger problem that we're all facing. We're aware of it. We are working very hard to solve it. And if your perception is that we're isn't, then yeah, we want to talk to you and let you know everything that we're doing, because we're doing quite a bit. So I'm going to take the prerogative of the mic for just a minute. I'm sorry. No. First of all, thank you so much. I love what you're doing with this wellness summit. Um, I was an um, elementary school teacher myself, and I love what you're doing with the mental illness, and I think everything you guys are saying is amazing. You're gonna help the next generation. Um, and however, w we were chased by, again, homeless man with a knife, that's why I'm here with my toddler right now. We're just, a lot of moms are just so scared. Like there's times that I don't even wanna walk at night, and I've lived in Boston, I lived in New York City, so. <laughs> I know, you want to say hi? I know what it's like to live in a big city and I know what you guys are going through. Um, that being said, I never see cops. I never, I live on 23rd in Santa Monica. Um, we've had six bikes stolen. We've had our moped stolen. It took the cops 20 minutes just to get to us when we reported those. Um, there's just so many things I can't say, but like I said, I know you guys are doing all you can but it just feels like there's not enough cops. And whatever we can do to get more cops, like New York City had, I mean, they did it. I lived there for 10 years. I felt so safe there, and I would walk around at four in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like to say is I'd like to, we're not going to be able to get into all these issues, but I want to assure you that on issues like conservatorship, these are very complicated issues. We have some of the best minds in this community. One of the lead mental health judges lives here and was here the whole day today listening to the sessions. So these are complicated issues that we can't get into. I'm gonna take the prerogative of a quick pivot. There's, I know you're next, <laughs> but I do wanna introduce another one of our community leaders who's hosting us today, and that's Dr. Catherine Jeffrey from Santa Monica College. Thank you, and I, I do just have to take, again, 30 seconds and say, we chose this site because we really think this also represents the best of Santa Monica. I live here, and it was my vote for bond money that I think helped to make this the beautiful place it is, and I am so proud of that. And I, I really just want to say, this is an asset. We've talked about education, mm -hmm. and for $48 a credit, you can get a four-year degree in interaction design. This is the future for our young people. The technology and the resources and the facility here are amazing, and we're showcasing it in a partnership. This is evidence of what we've got to build on to solve the very problems that we're struggling with. So I, I hear you, I hear the concern, and I can feel the concern coming from here. I want to acknowledge that. I'm somebody who lives here and raised my kids here and worked on these issues. They're tough issues. For the sake of moving on, I'm going to ask that we're going to go to you, and you have yeah. the mic, and thank you for waiting. Well, uh, thank you so much for the event, the Wellbeing uh, Summit. This has been great, an opportunity for us to share with you what we have been doing for the community also. My name is Lydia McGarrian, Chronic Disease Prevention for Santa Monica Family YMCA. I'm an immigrant. I have been here since 1990. I love the Santa Monica, and uh, our goal for the YMCA, the cause of the YMCA, to strengthen youth for uh, youth development, healthy living, and social re uh, responsibility. And that's why I am here today, to talk about that we are working 
um, giving our efforts with the community hospitals, organizations. We are working with the chronic disease prevention. And my, the way, my, my position right now here is to ask for the Santa Monica City to partnership with us, to help us out, to help our community in preventing diabetes that is rising tremendously, uh, for cancer survivors to have opportunity to come and exercise for 12 weeks free program at the YMCA, for blood pressure control. It's another very big issue. I just was uh, participating in the symposium of USC and they are talking so much about blood pressure. Yeah. So I would like to know how the city of Santa Monica can partnership and help us out for this special event on Thursday, December 5th. <laughs> well, that's a, that's, a, that's a specific ask. Um, but I think it goes, and, and I, we obviously can't make any commitments here today, but I think it goes to Dr. Adler's point that one of the ways we're going to move the needle on this work is the city cannot bestow well-being on people. That what we can do is create an environment for those partnerships to work. And certainly someone like the YMCA is a, work, is a partner that we would like to work with. So okay. Thursday might be a little tight. Um, but, but I think over the long term, that's exactly the kind of thing we want to invest in. So I think we're getting this, the high side. So we're going to do two things. We're going to take one more question in the back. And, and we, okay, in the spirit of connection, we had a wonderful workshop going on simultaneously called Civic Love. And the folks that were part of that workshop, this is an improv event, let me just tell you folks. The fo hang on, hang on. The folks that came from that event are going to come in after we take one more question in the back. We'll answer it. We're going to be brief with that question, please. And then we're going to hear from Civic Love as we wrap it up. Excellent. And then, uh, were you finishing? Did I interrupt you? No, I was Oh, finished. I thought I was Alejandro finished. just said, let the mayor finish. So I didn't know if I did that. <laughs> so the question's right back there. So this question, and then we will, then we will hear from Civic Love. Hi, my name is Sirma and I live in the Pico neighborhood. And I heard you talking a lot about the Pico neighborhood. And um, I heard the woman's comment in the front about how this is the first time I guess she feels unsafe. And we um, here from the Pico neighborhood, we were just sharing how we, this is like for us and many that we feel safe. Yeah, in the Pico neighborhood because we didn't feel safe many years ago when we had youth violence going on. Our kids, you know, were getting killed in the neighborhood. Um, the police was trying to arrest its way out of the problem. And so there's lessons learned. The police and getting more police, it, that's not what's going to help this issue of the homeless. Um, we've learned that through what happened in the Pico neighborhood. And so it had to be a collective work that community, city, everybody comes together, but not arresting its way or a police problem. That is not what rid youth violence in the Pico neighborhood. Bravo. Okay. So Alejandro, back to you, and we're gonna incorporate civic love as you wrap up, so I'm gonna have you figure out how to do that. Because this is Santa Monica. Stuff wow. happens. I uh, have no idea how to wrap up more than uh, I think you have the right questions, which is keep defining what well-being is for you, how to make it important and relevant for everyone, keep measuring it, and most importantly, define what and how you want to do it. But most of all, I'm, uh, I want to congratulate everyone uh, for the tremendous amount of of work you've already been doing, and particularly thank the mayor and uh, city manager, Rick uh, and Gleam, for, for your participation today. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. So now, now we're going to hear from Evan, who did something that I don't know how it went, but you'll tell us. This was entirely a surprise. Uh, the end of uh, this meeting ended up here. So we are bringing our conclusion to all of you. My name is Evan Meyer. Uh, I am the founder and executive director of Beautify Earth. Maybe you've seen a lot of the murals up in Santa Monica. Uh, I also started this thing called Civic Love, 
uh, about a year ago, and it's, the purpose is to get people to take action today on things that are important to them and conduct a workshop that can help them get there and think through the things that maybe they haven't thought of before. So in this workshop, we had a handful of people ended up making it across the, the, um, the campus. That's the word. And we have a few ideas that people are excited about taking action on. And I'm proud to present them. How about if I hold this for you? That would be good. Hold your thumb on the thing, sir. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So the four, I, the, the, oh, I apologize. Four ideas that came up, I'm gonna be really brief uh, and I'm gonna say them all because in the essence of time, um, one person, one tree, where uh, people can find places and hosts, that's the next step, to find places and hosts for one person to be responsible for one tree in the community. We're, so we get a lot of plants. Uh, not palm trees, maybe, I don't know. Uh, Parkway Gardens, talking to neighbors is the first step to and going to the neighborhood groups and talking about how to get gardens on our parkways and make our parkways just a bit more beautiful and flavorful and friendly for all of us across the city. Number three, applying the well-being principles to city departments, um, starting uh, with permits and public-facing offices. One of the groups was very excited about bringing that to the city and all of these things and helping accelerate that so that, uh, so there's that, that's three. Uh, and four is safe routes to school and work, expanding the lanes and uh, green lanes and walking buses to middle schools and starting to make those a little bit safer. And the first step of that, starting with planning, learning the rules, learning how it works and bringing that to uh, make our communities a little bit safer. So those all came from these people. I didn't make those up. That came from the hand. It was about... This, this is just a handful of the people that, that made it across, but uh, they did a great job and they're excited to have some next steps. So thank you for allowing me to be here. This is <laughs> well, I got the sign to let you in, so I let you in. I want to thank everyone for coming. We're wrapping in five minutes outside with a gift from Bhutan. There's Bhutanese dancers who are here to um, give us a little bit of their culture and thank they're thanking us for Kinga's participation and for working together. So please join us outside. Thank you.